I thought that putting some of this in a little bit of a technology trends context would make make it interesting and make most sense. So I think we all know this, right? We're seeing such a rapid change in the model of computing. I mean, just in the last you know 30 years, we've seen what, five or six different IT models. Uh, there is a new one happening right now, which is this whole cloud native application trend. And that's the one we're gonna focus on here right now. A lot of what we're gonna talk about is really motivated by new workloads. So we think AI and ML are part of that trend. Uh, it's also kind of very blurry with big data analytics. Uh, you guys already brought up the edge. And so we think a lot of these applications will get deployed in this new you know, locations and, and uh, a lot of dist different distribution models. It's really rapid. And we're, we're trying to design technologies that are relevant today, but also future proof so that they can carry us forward. Um, I inserted this because I thought it might be interesting to see that uh, I can date myself a bit here. Uh, my early journey started with uh, learning the Macro 11 assembler language on a PDP-11. Anybody remember that one? And then I uh, towed around a Spark Station 1 and a full giant sun monitor in my early days as an SC. That was really fun for United Airlines, I must say. All right. Um, so for us, I guess the most interesting parts of this is how the underlying components are really changing and how we can leverage them, right? And if you look at disk drives and IP network speeds and server densities, boy, they're just massively increasing, right? And 30 years is a long time, but then I look back at just the last 10 years. So 10 years ago, I was with one of the first object storage companies. What were we shipping? We were shipping hardware and software systems. Uh, we had a whole 10 terabytes in one U, in a one U enclosure. So that meant you needed 20 U to get to 200 terabytes. Well, now what do we get? We get a petabyte in for you, right? So really just massive changes. This has a real bearing on also the software, right? Because it means that even the data protection has to change to make sure that if a drive fails, you can do all the right things and keep the data durable. So another big trend that we just keep up on. Uh, this is the one I think that's the most relevant, right? We're really seeing massive amounts of applications being deployed. Uh, there's some huge statistics out there. You can read the big analysts as much as I can, but they're seeing they're they're really predicting some enormous numbers. You know, 500 million new applications. 50% uh, of these things get deployed at the edge. I think it's a little bit more interesting to talk to somebody practical. You know, we hear that Google, of course, has modernized their whole application, their whole infrastructure to Kubernetes. Now we see it happening in banks, right? JP Morgan went up on stage recently with Amazon, with AWS, and talked about refactoring, fully refactoring 6,000 applications to cloud native and really using that to deal with the hundreds of petabytes of data that they have. So we think this is real. And obviously, there's also the projections that AI will add value to the gross majority of those applications. So this hits a little bit now at the heart of what you asked, Ray, which is how is this changing the workload and especially with respect to storage, right? And over the last three or four years, we've seen a lot of this. We've seen a lot of big data deployments. We didn't see that seven, eight, nine years ago, right? In, in the decade ago timeframe, we saw a lot of static data, dormant data, data that had to be archived. You, you wrote it once and you read it maybe never, right? Now we're seeing these much more interactive applications, right? They do tend to have their large payloads. They're still video and imaging, but there's a lot of small payloads. I'll talk a little bit about a Splunk workload that we saw that you would expect would be megabytes uh, sized objects and files, but in some cases they ended up being a kilobyte and below, okay? So there is gonna be more demand on random IO, on the performance for random IO. We're also starting to see people use metadata and to really use it to enrich the data, but then they also want a way to retrieve the data more intelligently based on those kind of tags. And I'll talk about some new approaches for that. Uh, in the end, we're sort of expecting that applications will need this more demanding IO you know, intensive type of workload, even against an object store. And as Brad said, it's one of the main reasons we really designed our new product, Arteska, the one we announced a month ago. Um, and then lastly, I mean, how much machine data are we all gonna get? And you know, the edge plays a huge role in that. It's another factor that let us, you know, drove us to think about a smaller, easier to deploy storage system that could be really hands off and you know, deployed at the edge and, and managed autonomously. Um, Kubernetes. So this underpins this whole cloud native wave. Uh, you know, we've all heard about it now. 
a lot of the new applications, including the big commercial ones, are starting to be deployed as containers orchestrated on Kubernetes. Those kind of services naturally make uses, use of APIs, right? They use APIs to call Kafka and other database services. They're a natural way also to talk to storage. So we really think that the Amazon S3 API is a natural way for those apps to interact with storage, but also to have automated storage provisioning over APIs. We are seeing the emergence of storage provisioning interfaces for Kubernetes. Uh, you might have heard about CSI, the Container Storage Interface. Uh, there's a, that is for block and file volumes. There's a new one now emerging called COSI. Uh, the O is for object. So this is the object storage provisioning interface. We really think that that will help sort of uh, increase the adoption of object storage in this world as well. Uh, there's a really big advantage here, right? I mean, one of the classic problems we had in compute intensive environments before, especially if you looked at things like HDFS, is as you scaled it up, what did you need to do? You had to scale up the computing power, but sort of in lockstep with the capacity, right? And that ended up being pretty wasteful. Sometimes you didn't need that much storage. Sometimes you didn't need that much performance. Now with this new model, the storage is on the network. You can scale it independently. Uh, if you need a lot of compute and relatively little storage or the inverse, uh, you do it the right way. So there's really much more efficiency, no waste, and ultimately it hits the cost side of things. Um, I wanted to make it a little practical and talk about a few things that we're seeing in the field. We already mentioned Splunk. There is, of course, Apache Spark. Uh, there's Vertica, another vendor in the space. They're all, there are ways to embrace object storage for all of them. And then I want to conclude quickly with some notes on how people are optimizing data access with search strategies for object storage. Uh, Splunk, as Brad talked about, we've been dealing with for years. Uh, they've had a traditional model of storage access for a long time, you know, file system based. As you increased the compute tier, the indexing tier on Splunk, you added more capacity. They've now decoupled that through a model they call Smart Store. Okay, so Smart Store is their new intelligent storage in interface. It does tiering for hot and warm data. Uh, but the beauty of it is it, it separates the indexing tier from the storage. And how it does that is it's starting to use object storage primarily. Uh, it has algorithms for taking data off of the object store, pulling it into the cache manager, and letting the indexes operate on that very transparently. And then based on age or access patterns or other things, uh, migrating it off to storage. This is what we're seeing now in practice with Splunk. Uh, there is a certification process that object stores have to go through. Uh, Brad mentioned a bank deployment. Uh, that we've done with Splunk. This is uh, a little bit of a case study on that one. Uh, it is a US bank. Uh, they wanted to create a data lake for things like threat detection and fault and, and uh, fraud, fraud analysis. Uh, the technical challenge was that they wanted a consumption like model, but they wanted it on prem. They didn't want to go to the cloud. Uh, HPE actually sold this through their Green Lake uh, consumption, you know, cloud like consumption model. It's massive. This thing started at uh, 60 petabytes. They're filling it up at 400 terabytes per day over S3. It then gets replicated from one site to another, hundreds of miles away. Uh, so think about the size of this deployment and it continues to grow. Uh, they actually originally underestimated the workload from Splunk, the customer did. They thought, we'll be writing to you at about a gigabyte per second. Turned out to be 10 times uh, or more than that. It's 30 gigabytes per second of throughput. But what have they gained? They've gained this really efficient use of scale out, both on the compute tier and on the storage tier. So this has been a win. Um, Apache Spark, we are starting to see more and more of this as well, especially in this AI and ML, ML world. Uh, you guys are the experts on this. You know that there's different models of deploying this. Uh, typically, we've heard that there's you know, a model in the cloud and a model on-prem. Uh, in the cloud, people tend to use things like uh, Amazon's Elastic MapReduce or Databricks, and then they combine that with Amazon S3. So it is using object storage. On-premise, though, it still tends to be primarily HDFS-based. Uh, you know, that's really, really common. Is there a single architecture that can work both ways? Uh, we think there is. Uh, Spark actually can read and write data to an object store through a file system connector. Uh, that's implemented in Hadoop and it's provided by the, those suppliers. Those connectors make the object store look 
close to a file system. It has the notion of directories and files. It gives you the uh, you know classic operations like rename on the file system. Uh, so what does it look like? Uh, it's referred to as S3A. Uh, it's essentially a connector that lets uh, Spark uh, you know executing applications talk directly to Hadoop. Uh, so you gain this model. And by the way, this will work on both in both the cloud and on-prem. So it seems to have some really nice advantages there. Um, the third one that I'd, I'd highlight, just really to show you that this trend is continuing. Uh, these vendors are really embracing object storage. Uh, Microfocus Vertica is another one. You know, this is another big data analytics application. They had their classic mode of coupling storage and compute together. Now they have what's called Eon mode. And similar to Splunk Smart Store, it sits on top of Amazon S3 and drives the very same advantages. So if you have bursty workloads, increase the compute and keep the storage as shared. Okay, so lots of good advantages from that. Um, now let's talk about search. So there's been a lot of work in the cloud for optimizing data retrieval. Uh, notably, if you look at Amazon, they've had a couple of models of doing this. One of them is called Amazon Athena. Uh, the other one is a newer one called S3 or SQL Select. Uh, and then a number of object storage vendors, ourselves included, provide a capability called metadata search. So let's take a quick look at them, but I want to focus on the third one. So the easiest way to understand Athena, and a few of you may have looked at it, is that it's a SQL on top of S3. Uh, but the way it works is sort of to provide a table-like view that's projected on top of S3 buckets. Okay, so the model here is that you maintain your Amazon data as buckets and individual objects. Those objects get formatted into JSON or CSV or some other kind of tabular format. So you have attributes running uh, within the object. The table maps the schema on top of those objects, right? So the object attributes become the column, uh, the column attributes. Okay, and then SQL can be used to query that to run sort of normal type searches against the, the database. Uh, there's a different model forming now with what is called S3 Select. This really tremendously changes the data format, the object model to some extent. Rather than having the classical object uh, bucket with many objects, now you have a bucket with one giant object. Okay, and you format that object as rows, CSV, JSON, or Parquet. Uh, and then you use SQL to filter or scan within that. These are not optimized searches. It's not doing indexes. It's really doing you know, brute force scans. They can be divided and conquered and parallelized. But the key is it's within one giant object. Okay, so that's sort of a very different approach for having to take your data and you know, extract and transform and load it. Uh, the last one that I wanted to highlight then is metadata search. So S3, as you might know, uh, provides a whole set of predefined system level metadata attributes things like the owner of the object, the ID of the object, the creation date, uh, the location, et cetera. Uh, applications can extend that metadata. Amazon, the API makes that possible. Uh, there's a special set of headers and you can use that to define your own attribute value pairs on S3. I think they give you up to two kilobytes of space to do that. Um, so an example might be, let's say you put a JPEG object in an object store, but I wanna tag it with a study ID and a study location. Okay, that's a kind of a pseudocode example of how I might want to do that. Uh, metadata search is supported in object stores like our own, both in, in Ring and Arteska. Uh, it does provide index optimized search. We have a database under the covers for managing metadata anyway. Um, the cool thing is if you run the query, it's basically like doing a bucket listing. So you say, get my bucket, but you express the search criteria. So here I say, get me only the objects that have a tag of uh, location in San Francisco. We return only the object IDs that match that search and we do it in an intelligent way. So it can really help the application by eliminating the need to do client side or application side filtering. Okay, so I guess that's the, the, the world as we see it now. We see lots of new AI and ML. They are getting deployed on Kubernetes and there's a real trend, not just from us, the storage vendors, but from the app vendors to start embracing object storage. It's, it's a new world for us.